Good night, everybody who is listening to us. I'm here again with my friend David Eats, and today we're going to talk about Amulek's sermon to the Ammonites. It's good to be here with you, Pedro. Thank you, David. It's good to see you again. So we're going to cover chapters Alma 10 and Alma 11, and this is the time when Alma and Amulek, they go together and they're preaching to the people in Ammonihah, and it happens around 82 BC. And this ha happens right after Amulek was prepared by Alma, after Alma was in his house and prepared him um, for this ministry. And the first thing that I think it's interesting is when Amulek steps forth to begin preaching the gospel, the first thing that he, he says is he states his genealogy. He says that he's a descendant of, of, of Lehi, of Lehi the prophet who came from Jerusalem. And also he states the, the, the descendancy of Lehi. And he says that Lehi descends from Manasseh. Now the tribe of Manasseh, which is one of the lost tribes of Israel, alongside of the tribe of Ephraim, is charged with taking the restored gospel to the world and to gather scatter Israel. So I just think it's very interesting how Amulek, uh, thousands of years before the restoration, belonging to the tribe of Manasseh, or the, being a descendant of the tribe of Manasseh, is telling a story that's going to be recorded in the Book of Mormon, right? That is the stick of Ephraim that is going to be restored, and then this, this story is going to be later on known by all of us. I think that's uh, very interesting because even uh, even in their well, they're I mean they're not here anymore, but they are still as a, as members of the tribe of Manasseh. They are still participating in bringing the gospel to to everyone, right? Because of their words in the Book of Mormon, and Amulek, of course, is included in in this group of people. So that's a that's very interesting. Thank you, Pedro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing that I also enjoyed in chapter 10 was how um, in, in relation to our, our last video about being called to serve, um, here we can see that Amulek does fulfill his call. And what was his call? Well, we'll, we'll remember that his call was to um, encourage the Ammonites to to repent, and he he goes about it in a very interesting way. Um, in in verse twenty five of chapter ten, he starts saying, "O oh, ye wicked and perverse generation, why has Satan got such a great hold upon your hearts?" Uh, so really, he goes in guns blazing in his mission to call these people to repentance. He does. And it's interesting when, on many instances on these uh, chapters, after Amulek finishes his speech, it repeats, and the people were astonished by what Amulek said. So this is, this is right after Alma begins speaking, and the people get angry with Alma, and they're about to arrest Alma, and then Amulek steps forth. Yeah. And he says, I am Amulek, I am just a regular guy. He introduces himself as a man of good standing among his family and friends, a man that has worked hard for his wealth. And I think that helps him in preaching repentance to these people because different than Alma, that was the high priest and former supreme judge over all the land, Amulek was just his regular guy. He says that he, he didn't know much or didn't believe much in the ways of the Lord. But nonetheless, the Lord goes and he calls Amulek to be a missionary and to preach repentance unto people. Mm -hmm. So these people are just looking at this guy and they're having a, like a relatable experience. They're saying, oh, this is just a regular guy. Maybe they knew Amulek before and that, that just helps Amulek in his mission, you know, who he was. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it's interesting that uh, you bring up the fact that they they were astonished. Um, of course, I, I that makes a lot of sense to me, uh, considering Amulek's background, which you 
uh, you detailed. He was one of them, right? He used to be one of them. And then here he comes out saying that they need to repent. So very, you know, very surprising to some of these people. Um, but after that surprise, of course, they say, well, maybe, you know, some of them said, well, maybe he's right. Clearly, because in the in, in the subsequent verses, we know that some people did believe on his words. Um, so after the initial surprise, maybe his background helped him, uh, yeah, relate to these people a lot more. Absolutely. And just picking up on the comment that we're talking on the on our video, who is Amulek? We're talking about how, how the Lord was preparing Amulek. So I think it's just interesting when you're converted into the gospel, you realize that your past experiences that you might have thought as, as failures, they're not really. You know, Amulek, he had this preparation, this time that he had to spend among people as a commoner, as a non-believer at first. That was Amulek's preparation. So no effort is wasted to the Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I think that's very interesting. Um, that that's how he started his his uh, his sermon. Um, and of course then he gets um, he gets the lawyers all riled up and and so that produces a very interesting exchange with, with Zeezrom, um, in which the Spirit, of course, guides him through and allows him to counter all of the things that, um, that the lawyers are trying to do, all the traps that they're trying to put, and because they really want him to contradict himself, of course, right? Because they got to get something to put him in jail <laughs> or something to... To make people angry with them, and so the spirit, of course, helps helps him go through that, and um, and tells him, you know, how it, to to avoid the bribe that Zeezrom is is trying to lay. So I think that that's very interesting how he transitions from, um, you know, guns blazing, repent, and then he's on the. He, he goes on the defensive, but very effective in his defense, right? Because the spirit is there. The spirit helps to helps him to to counter what the lawyers are saying. Absolutely. You know, we talked about we talk a lot about the gift of discernment, about knowing what's on the hearts of people, so we can give a good answer, so we can really defend. The cause of Jesus Christ, and just thinking about how the Spirit wore in the Amulek in that time, it just reminds me that you know, in times of trial or challenge, the Spirit of the Lord can let us know these absolute truths. He can give us uh, the direction we need to overcome these trials. Absolutely, yeah. So, and and it's a wonderful promise, and it's accessible to to us as well, right? Um, so the things that we see Amulek doing, well, we can do those things as well. Perhaps we're not going to go out onto the streets and, and yell that people are wicked and perverse. But, <laughs> um, but we certainly have the promise that the, the Spirit will enlighten us in our interactions with other people. Absolutely. And it's all about choice, right? Uh, I mean, President Nelson talked recently about... Uh, how we're not going to be able to survive these times of trial if we don't have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. And it has everything to do with, with what we choose, how we use our time, what is the intent of our actions. Very important, the intent of our actions. And I just like how Amulek is calling out these people and he's preaching about the importance of people using their agencies wisely freely but wisely he says people should be free to choose what they want and then he says when people are free and with that freedom they begin to choose iniquity that's when society will be destroyed and he warned specifically about three things that will come to destroy the the lamanites 
uh, well, this the, the, the wicked part of the neophytes. Yeah. But he talks about famine, pestilence, and the sword. So these are the prices that society pays for not choosing wisely. Yeah. The and well, we're not going to really cover it later. So it's worthwhile to mention that the city of Ammonihah is completely destroyed. Um, you know, a, a few moments after um, Alma and Amulek leave. I mean, the Lamanites come and destroy this this big city. And the Ammonihites were very, um, I guess, kind of kind of cocky and saying, oh, no one can destroy us, na, na, na. Uh -huh. And, well, the, here come the Lamanites. And it was a, it was a complete destruction. I, they, it was. they later called the place the, uh, the desolation of the Nihors. Ter like, terrible destruction. So we see the consequences of unrighteous choices by a, com a, by a society, right? Absolutely. And it's so funny because at this point is Amulek and Alma, just two guys saying, if you remain wicked, then the famine, pestilence, and the sword are going to fall over you. And then a couple of moments later, they're like, no, 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 let's kick out all the believers. Let's kick them out of this town. So it's like there's a civil unrest going on this town because they cannot simply live with people who believe. They decide to kick out this huge part of the population and then they're unprepared, facing the consequences of unrest. Yeah. And who shows up in that moment? The Lamanites. Lamanites, yeah. I mean, is it too far a stretch to think that the Lamanites had spies in the city thinking, uh, let's watch them and let's see when they're, they're weak so we can attack? And then it's, it's almost like it's a fulfillment of the prophecy of Amulek that, the word, that this word is going to fall over them. Yeah. Yeah. And, um... The scriptures are full of examples of prophecies being fulfilled, and this is this is an unfortunate one, of course, but it is nonetheless uh, an example as to what happens when you know when a when a promise is made. The Lord made a promise that He would destroy these people, and and unfortunately, they did not heed that that warning uh, that was given to them by Alma and Amulek. Yeah. Um, which leads us into chapter 11 um, that the Lord it, Zeezrom asks um, asks Amulek in verse 34 so uh, chapter 11 verse 34 Zeezrom asks, shall uh, the Son of God, so shall the Son of God save his people in their sins? So very interesting question. Shall the Son of God save the people in their sins? And Amulek's response is no. And it's, it's one word. One word is in. That the Lord doesn't save us in our sins. Right? So we cannot access mercy while we continue to voluntarily defy um, the Lord. So, like, okay, he gave us the commandments and let's just keep sending. Everything's going to be okay. He'll save us later. That's not how it works. Um, but Zia I don't think Ziazim quite understood that, and which is why Amulek had to explain that. The Lord does not save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. And so if we choose to repent, if we choose to repent, then we can be saved. Right? We can, we can have our past, our past sins erased in the memory of God. And so, yeah, it, this is on a, on a micro level, right? We have access to the atonement of Jesus Christ, which can save us from our sins. Now apply this on a macro level to the society in Ammonihah. 
They didn't rep repent from their sins. Therefore, Heavenly Father was unable to save them. Right? In their sins. Heavenly Father can't save them in their sins. He could, through the atonement of Jesus Christ, save them from their sins. But they couldn't save them in their sins, which is why they got destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, if you think about people being in their sins, it's the opposite of being in the path that leads to Christ. It's like saying that you can be humble at the same time that you're proud. It's like you're saying that you can be uh, patient and at the same time you're anxious about things. You can't. So it, it really is about changing our behaviors, right? Changing our behaviors and starting to act more like Christ. You know, it's, it's Christ's example that was, you know, set forth by the way that he's responded to his trials. That is the way that we must follow to be saved. Is literally, we change ourselves by following Christ's example. We allow him to become a part of us when we try to emulate him. If you talk about the meaning of the word worship, it's trying to become, try imitating that person. So we're trying to, we're letting, we're letting Christ in us by changing. Yeah. And that's how he saves us, as you said, from our sins. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, and just connecting that, to the, to the next part, that I, next comment that I have here, which is uh, right, up, right after that, Amulek preaches about Christ's role as the creator of this, this earth and the designer of the plan of salvation. And he uses a very particular language. He says, he is the very eternal father of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Now, does it, does it mean that Jesus Christ is also the father? No, he doesn't. He is just stating the quality of Jesus Christ as the creator of heaven and earth and all things that live within it. And I really like how also he is the architect of this plan of salvation that is connected to being the architect of the whole of of earth and all all the living things and just connecting that to, to hebrews uh chapter 5 verse 8 and 9 it says though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him so how is Jesus Christ the very eternal father of heaven and earth and of the plan of salvation? Simple, because of the example that he set, because of the obedience that he learned by the things he suffered. And the way he responded to these things is how he was made perfect. And that's what it means to be the author of eternal salvation. That's the path that we must follow. The, this is something that... Uh... In the early stages of studying the gospel um, or studying the Book of Mormon, uh, this is something that tripped me up: is how can the scriptures say that Jesus is the eternal Father, and yet we believe that Jesus and uh, Heavenly Father are two distinct beings? Uh, but that's when, yeah, that's when doing research, you understand that. Um, particularly in, in this verse, uh, in, uh, in verse 11, um, 39, sorry, chapter 11, verse 39, uh, you understand that the reason why we call Jesus the Father is, yeah, because he was the one who, uh, under the direction of Heavenly Father, created this planet that we live on. And so, yeah, he, he is the creator. Um, the other thing is, is that through, through the process of repentance and baptism and change that we brought up in, you know, just a few minutes ago, he becomes our father, right? Because we become sons of, of, of God. So, um, because we're born again, 
right? And so he is our father in that sense as well. So there's there's different reasons why we we call Jesus the Father, but very important distinction: he is not heavenly Father, right? I mean, there's there's that difference there, which is very important. Yes, thank you, David. And and the final comment that I have here of what I learned in this um, in Amulek's sermon to the Ammonites, and he's preaching about resurrection. He says that Christ's power loses the bands of death and that the spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form and stand before God. And now a very powerful statement, having a bright recollection of all our guilt. That's a very powerful statement. And after the resurrection, spirit and body will become immortal. I mean, I think that's one of the that's one of the mysteries of God, isn't it? One of the main mysteries of Christianity is I, I can understand, philosophically speaking, you know, Christ had an example. If we follow the example, we can redeem yeah. ourselves. We have that redemption and that change. But Christ's power losing the bands of death, that's a whole other mystery. And that's one of the most valuable promises that we have. What do you think about that? Because I, I think it's a very mysterious thing yeah um it boils down to faith i think do we have enough faith to believe that one day we can have our bodies our perfected bodies right mind you our perfected bodies and our spirits come back together you know do we have enough faith to to think that that is true um the, the scriptures are full of reassurances that that is the case. And one of the one of these moments is here when Amulek tells us about that. The, the important thing is the victory over death, over physical death, is for everyone. Right? Everyone will resurrect, no matter what we've done in this earth. But it is not everyone that will be saved from the second death, which is separation from Heavenly Father's presence. In order to qualify for that, we have to be freed of our guilt, right? We have to be, we have to repent. Um, but we'll remember everything. Everything that we did, we will remember when we come back. Um, but yeah, resurrection. What a great promise. <laughs> what a great promise that one day we can come back uh, in our perfected forms. And if we live righteously, that promise will be even sweeter. Because we will know that not only will we come back physically... But we will also be able uh, to be in the presence of our Heavenly Father if we've done the right thing. So, Thank you. Yeah, it's really about feeling comfortable in the presence of an eternal Creator, Heavenly Father, knowing what you've done, right? That's why it says yeah. a bright recollection of all your guilt. Uh, you're not going to want... To be near him, knowing everything. That's why we need to repent. Yeah. I, I can't remember who it was. Um, it's either Brad Wilcox or you know, someone, one of those motivational speakers that are members of the church that said that we, it's not like heavenly, it's not like Jesus Christ will like be like, hey, you know, like, go away. <laughs> It'll be, he'll be so sad to see us go on the last day. Um, he'll be very sad to see us go because, yeah, you brought something up. We won't feel comfortable in his presence knowing what we've done. And we will say that his judgments are, are, are right. 
you know, we'll say, gosh, well, I know what I did and I don't deserve to be here. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a lower level because I know that I don't deserve to be there, to be here. Uh, so th that's something that your comment reminded me of. Thank you, David. So thinking about all of this, I want to extend this invitation to all those who are watching us today of thinking about the question that David asked us, do we have enough faith to believe that Christ can lose the bands of death? So my invitation to all of you who are watching us is think of one thing that you can start doing that will fortify your faith in Jesus Christ. Think of one thing that you can stop doing that will fortify your faith in Jesus Christ. As you follow that invitation, you will be one step closer to really changing your nature, your heart, your mind, everything. And that is the invitation that I, that I extend to you today. And if you like this video, please like and, and subscribe. And we'll have more content available soon. Thank you, David, for sharing your amazing insights. Well, thank you for thank you for indulging me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you next time. All right, bye. -bye. See you next time, bye.